We're in the middle of a series entitled Life from Death. You can see the amazing graphic right there. Josh took us last week through the death of Moses. Remember, Israel has come out of Egypt. They're about to step foot in the promised land. And what happens? Their beloved and amazing leader dies. Now, that could be a bit of a damper when you think you're about ready to hit prime time, right? And all of a sudden, it's not going to be the way you thought. And yet, God does something special, and he raises up a new leader, and he takes them into a new stage of life. And in some ways, you know, our church is in a similar situation as we begin to breathe new campuses out there, uh, and, and as we new locations, and we send them forward. Uh, and also in our lives, right? We've seen it before that, that God can take death and bring life from it. And so this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to keep it moving specifically in the story of Joshua. Um, if you were here, you probably remember we had a theme verse for the series. It's pulled from John 12, verse 24. It's It says this, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, if it dies, it produces many seeds. And our goal is to be people who produce many seeds. Uh, This morning, we're going to see if we can get our hearts and lives shaped to look a little bit more like Jesus. Uh, Maybe you've walked into the room this morning, you're a bit disillusioned. You're sitting there saying, hey, I feel like life hasn't worked out for me the way I thought it would. I feel like my faith isn't growing the way I thought it would. I feel like my job is just not where I want it to be, or my family is kind of not in the place I was hoping for, or my marriage isn't where I want it, or I've got these problems with friends and I don't know what to do this morning, I'm telling you, we can change and we can become different people. So stick with me. Um, We're going to go through three movements. First, we're going to look at uh, the Bible and the story of a guy named Achan this morning and what he did wrong. Then we're going to take and and kind of apply it to our lives a little bit in the second movement and try to figure out what it is about us that might be broken. And then third, we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to have a door of hope inside of our lives. But before we get there, would you guys be willing to pray with me real fast? Father, this morning we step in expectantly, hoping that you will move again. Lord, we know that you're here and we give you permission to change us and shape us. God, will you clean out the corners of our hearts that we don't even know need to be cleaned? God, will you change our patterns of behavior that we might be people who act and live differently in this world? God, bless our lives. Do what even you have not done yet. Father, we love you and we uh, trust you as we do this. It's in your name we ask these things, Father. Amen. Well, a lot has happened between Joshua 1 and Joshua 7, so let me give you a quick rundown of where things are at. When we left them, they were just ready to cross the Jordan River. They have now crossed. We're in the promised land. Yes, they have a commitment ceremony where they renew their covenant with God, and then they get their first major victory. The walls of Jericho come tumbling down. If you've been around church for a long time, you know Joshua and the walls of Jericho, right? Maybe if you're one of those people like me who kind of grew up in church, you even had points where you like set up cardboard boxes and you marched around them and then knocked them over and you all cheered or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful, cool. Not just me. Um, so they have this big victory, and once the big victory happens, they get really expectant. Hey, maybe the promised land is going to be as easy to take as God has told us it was going to be. So they scout out this city named Ai, and they send some troops up there, and they're like, hey, it's kind of like a little hamlet. Let's just send a few up there. It should be pretty easy to take it. And they go up there, and what happens? Oh, they get their butts kicked, and they actually kill 36 of their people. And they come back with their tails tucked between their legs, and they tell Joshua, hey, this isn't what we thought it was. And all of a sudden, Joshua's apoplectic, and maybe it's a little bit like us sometimes when it comes to a spiritual life, right? You think you're headed into the promised land, then all of a sudden, it's not working the way you thought it was. And Joshua's sitting there saying, what is happening, God? I thought you were going to give the land to us. And the thing that we kind of forgot to mention a little bit here is that God had created a rule before they went into the promised land, before they went to the place that was supposed to be their place of rest and their sense of peace. God had told them, hey, when you take cities, don't plunder them. Don't go in and like take all the money and take all the good stuff. You guys are going to be different. You're my people. You're going to be my representatives in this land. So as you conquer a city, I want you to be a blessing to the city. You're not going to be like all those other nations. You're not going to be kind of like this roving pirate band that's just trying to get rich off of every new victory. You're not going to be a pirate band that walks around trying to like increase the amount of territory you have and tries to increase the prestige. I am prestigious enough for you, Israel. And so God tells them, whatever you do, do not plunder the cities. Don't do it that way. And so because of that, then they're supposed to act that way. So they battle, they take down Jericho, and they think everything's good, but something happened. And so God tells Joshua, he says, hey, when you guys took Jericho, somebody sinned. Somebody took some stuff. 
And so they start winnowing it down, going through their ranks, and they figure out that it's one guy named Achan. And so this morning, our passage picks up right there, Joshua 7, verse 19 through 26. If you've got a Bible on your phone, feel free to turn that on and open that up. If you want to use one of the, uh, the paper Bibles, they're right there in front of you in the pews, or we'll have it up on the screens as well. So the passage picks up with Joshua talking to Achan. He says this, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done and do not hide it from me. Achan replied, it is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder of a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside of my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and sure enough, there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all of Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons, his daughters, his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, his tents, all he had to the valley of Accor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all of Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them, and over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Accor ever since. And that is the word of the Lord. Now, I feel like there's something I should probably confess to you guys before we get too much further and start looking at this passage. See, I've got this issue, this problem. Um, I lived on the West Coast for a long time, and when I lived in Portland, Portland is really good at, like, vegan food. They're really good at, like, kale, Brussels sprouts, all that kind of stuff. So when we moved to Texas, it was, like, a little bit like moving to the promised land for food, right? Because I went to this place called a barbecue, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Texas pit barbecue, man. The first time you step in one, it's life-changing. This isn't like when you go to a counter and you order a little bit of meat here or there or something like that. This is like, this is the real deal. You got like pit masters back there and there's like smoke and you're about to smell like smoke the rest of the day, but you're going to smell delicious all day long. It's going to be wonderful, right? And when I get in that place and I start looking at all the meat that they've got lined up there behind the people, it's, it's kind of intoxicating, right? And so I've got this issue where my eyes typically are a wee bit bigger than my stomach is. And so I start ordering, and I'm like, you know, I'll take like a half pound of the brisket there. That looks really good. You know, yeah, yeah, right? And so I order a half pound of brisket. Then I order, like, then I'm like, well, you know, that pulled pork over there looks pretty good too, right? So I, I grab a little bit of the pulled pork, got a half pound of that. So I'm about a pound of meat. Then I'm like, you know, some of those bacon-wrapped jalapeno poppers would be really nice right now. So you get a few of those in there, right? So, you know, you're like a pound and a half, and you're like, maybe just toss a couple pieces of chicken on there, too. It doesn't have to be a half pound, just, just a little bit to taste it, right? So then usually, then my family's ordering, and I'm looking at my plate, and there's this one problem that always exists. I always look at the menu, and on the menu, there's always burnt ends. You ever had burnt ends before? Like the kind where it's just basically it's just fat and it's caramelized? It's delicious. It's wonderful. Yeah, little tiny pieces. They're like little candy poppers, right? And every single time, my wife's like starting to walk and starting to get us out the door. And I'm like, you know, hey, just, just give me a half pound of, the, of, of those burnt ends. I'll just take a half pound of that. And I'm like a couple pounds of meat and I'm walking out to my table. And, and it's always as I'm walking that I'm beginning to be like, I might have made a mistake here. This, this plate's really heavy. And all this food's about to go inside of me, right? And then I sit down, I take my first bite. And I'm like, ooh, I did not make a mistake. This is delicious, right? So you start eating and you start eating again. And have you ever had so much meat that you hit that point where all of a sudden you start kind of like, moving in your seat because you're getting uncomfortable, right? And you're looking at your plate and there's still more there and you're like, you're just kind of feeling it a little bit. There's this, there's this real condition in Texas. It's very, very real. Anybody else ever had the meat sweats, right? Where, yeah, there we go. This is for us right here. I, I, I set my examples to get down to the smallest amount of people in the room that will relate to it, right? Meat sweats. It's that moment when all of a sudden you've had so much that you literally have meat pouring out of your pores, right? Where all of a sudden you're sweating and you start smelling like brisket, right? And you start smelling like burnt ends and pulled pork. And it's not good, right? You're like, man, I have a wedding later today. This was probably a really bad decision to do this, right? And the problem is my body is not adapted to my cravings, right? And so despite my better interests, despite the fact that I should know better, despite the fact that I've done this over and over and over and over again, my cravings start driving my decision making. I become this glutton because all of a sudden I see it up there on the menu and I just have to have it. And it's like, it's almost like an uncontrollable. I need to order the burnt ends up there. And when that starts happening, I take myself into a place of death and hurt, right? 
And I wonder a little bit if this passage is similar in that way. See, our cravings are always a template for understanding what's happening under the surface inside of us. Because our cravings are the thing that reveal what our hearts actually want. And our cravings are the place where we begin to see how sin might enter in, brokenness might enter in, heartache, hurt, destruction, hardship enters into our lives. So take a look back at the passage again with me, verse 19. And with all of this in mind about cravings, read this passage again. So it says this, Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replies, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them, and I took them. See, here's the thing. Achan knows exactly what he's doing. Did you catch that? It's not like he's trying to hide it. He's not trying to obfuscate this and make this thing kind of fuzzy, like, oh, hey, you know, I put my tent down, and it's the strangest thing. They had buried some gold over there, and it was just inside of my tent. It was so weird, man. He's not even trying to be like, hey, you know, there were a couple pieces that fell out, and I meant to bring them forward. I just haven't done it, so I thought it would be best to hide them. He's not trying to lie or cover something up. He's being pretty straightforward. Hey, what I've done is take these things. Isn't it strange how your craving all of a sudden twists how you think about something? How does he know that there's 200 pieces of silver? Like, you might be able to count, like, what, like 10, maybe 15, like, ballpark as you're looking at it. But if you're getting to the 200 mark, you're setting those things up in a row, right? You're like, one, two, three, four, and you're counting those things up. How does he know how much that gold bar weighs, right? I mean, he's weighing it, right? So here's the thing. There's an intentionality to his crime, to what he's doing. And interestingly enough, it's probably not the first time that Achan has created trouble for Israel because in the Hebrew, his name actually means trouble. Achan is trouble, right? And if you're a real Bible nerd, something's happening under the surface in the Hebrew here. See, it's Achan and Achor, and Achan is bringing trouble, which is actually Yakor, on to the valley of Accor, and God will put trouble, a cart, upon him, right? So there's this kind of like wordplay that happens with his name. Usually not a good thing when there's a wordplay happening with your name inside of the Bible, right? He probably did something not so great. So verse 22, let's keep going with it. Joshua sent messengers. They run to the tent, and there it is, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua, and all the Israelites spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all of Israel, took them, all of his things, all the things that were in his tent, to the valley of Accor. Now, what's interesting here is that Israel realizes there's a gravity to the sin that Achan has committed, right? Remember, Achan is now responsible for 36 deaths. Because he committed a sin, because he did something wrong... 36 people have died at AI. And Israel is realizing this and realizing they need to get rid of the trouble in their midst because trouble is not something that can be easily confined, right? It has this way of like kind of seeping out and beginning to show up in places that you're not expecting it to be. And so they get rid of Achan. And here's the wild thing. They end up naming the valley, the first place that they are, in the promised land, the valley of trouble, the valley of accord. That's kind of not how you want to start your time inside of the promised land, right? So hold on to the idea of the Valley of Accor. We're going to come back to it in a moment, but we want to take a step back first and kind of move into a second stage here where we look at what this means on a personal level because the heart of what Achan is doing is craving and lusting after something so badly that it destroys him, and he does not care about the consequences. Achan is not worried that he's about to get destroyed. He wants it so bad that he's willing to be like, yeah, you know, I took the stuff. And here's the problem. I kind of sympathize and understand what he's talking about. Imagine if you're a slave and you've gotten free and now all of a sudden you're walking across the desert for a really long time and you get to the promised land. And all of a sudden you see this big pile of riches right here. And you look at it and you think, man, you know, the wife and I could be set up with that, right? I mean, once all the fighting's done, you you know, buy a little vineyard, maybe get ourselves a couple cows, right? You know, we could... I don't know, maybe put a pool in for the kids in the backyard. I mean, it would be great, right? And the problem is is that inside of his mind, he's beginning to justify his actions that he knows are wrong. He's probably sitting there saying, well, I mean, come on. You think I'm the only person that's taking silver and gold? Come on. Look at all these guys. I mean, doesn't everybody want a little trinket, right? 
and I'm not taking that much. It's not like I'm taking like a whole cartload of gold with me, right? I'm just taking just a few pieces, just enough to get us set up, right? And doesn't God love me? I mean, he's taking us to the promised land, so he wants me to be happy, right? So it's all right. This is just my own personal side, right? This doesn't affect everything else. And yet the reality is, and we all know this probably better than we would ever want to admit, that when there's brokenness in sin, it affects the people around you, right? If we're honest, this happens on a daily basis. Think about the moments where, you know, you're driving and you know what the speed limit is, right? You're like, all right, it is 55. Who puts a 55 speed limit on a freeway? Nobody that's fun, right? And so you start driving. And as you're driving, you're like, well, I mean, the other cars around me are going like 70, right? And I got a place that I need to get to and it's really important and it doesn't hurt anybody else, right? It doesn't hurt anybody. So I'm just going to I'm just going to step up beyond the rules. And the problem is is that the second you do that, you put yourself in the place of God, right? You put yourself as the deciding factor on what is legal and what is not legal, right? Think about it in another way. When you hear that juicy bit of gossip in the office, right? You hear that that so and so's got this going on, you're like, "Oh, man, I got to share it." I know I'm not supposed to. I know I shouldn't. I shouldn't say anything, but it won't hurt anybody else cuz I mean, everybody else in the office probably already knows, right? So we can just talk about it over here, and all of a sudden, you become the arbiter of what's right and wrong in your context, right? Sin is this. It is the assumption of the place of God in our own hearts and minds. And the problem is that it's really easy to justify when we do something wrong, right? We're really good at justifying our own things. And we become kind of almost addicted to that, right? addicted to be in the place of power, and our cravings begin to make that decision for us. And all of a sudden, we crave having fun talking with somebody else. We crave being there at the right time. We crave all these things, and our cravings start driving us, right? Now, it's pretty easy to see that. If you've ever spent time around addicts, you know this, right? Like, you ever spent time around, like, an alcoholic or somebody who's addicted to opioids or, or somebody that's in the midst of sexual addiction or, or somebody who's addicted to, 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 I don't know, to consumerism even? Think about it this way. When you're around somebody who lacks impulse control, it's really apparent to everybody except that person, right? And they're willing to do anything they can to fill that desire inside of them. See, last week was, was Prime Week on Amazon, right? Anybody else do a little Prime shopping? You start kind of looking around on the website, and it's one of those things where it's like, you've got pretty good impulse control at first, right? You kind of scroll through, you're like, well, we've already got a computer, we don't need one of those. I already got some, you know, tires on the car, don't need those, but then you're like, ooh, that's an exercise trampoline. I've always wanted an exercise trampoline, right? I was literally scrolling through, I found this weirdo exercise trampoline. And it was like half off. I mean, they're practically handing it to you at that point, right? And you find like the drill driver and you're like, well, I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had a drill driver around the house in case we needed to drive a drill or something, right? You don't even know, you're just like, it's cool looking, right? And so you order it. And the hard part is you get that little buzz for a couple minutes, right? You ever get that buzz after you shop where you're like, ooh, Prime, it's gonna be here in two days. And so you start kind of thinking of all the fun you're gonna have. And you get your trampoline, and it comes in two days, and you start kind of like bouncing. You're like, yeah, this is, this is not as fun as I thought it would be. Good thing it was half off, right? So then you go back on Amazon again, and all of a sudden you're looking for something else. And you're stuck in the control, in the grip of a craving, right? Of wanting to fill that hole inside of you where, like, maybe something else will be the thing that fills it up. And the problem is this, is that our cravings always end up ripping us apart when they get disproportionate. Think about the person, I'm sure you've all known somebody who was in a relationship. They, they finally get together with the person they've always wanted to be with, and they smother them, right? They're like, hey, I love you so much. I want to hug you, kiss you, squeeze you forever and ever and ever, right? And that other person's like, whoa, dude, like little, little much, little fast, right? And, and the object of their affection starts pushing further away, and the further away the object of their affection pushes, what happens? They go closer, right? They're, they're like diving in, like, no, no, let me be close. It's just you and me against the world. It's going to be so wonderful, Right? And the problem is, is every time that happens, their craving for that person gets so strong and so out of balance that it ends up pushing them away. And the thing that they wanted so badly is the thing that they lose most easily. So don't fool yourself here. Here's the problem. A lot of the spectacular addiction kind of things, whether it's alcoholism or, you know, whether it's people who get into messed up relationships, whether it's consumerism, those are all pretty easy to identify, right? Those are the things that for us, we can look at and be like, yeah, I got a problem with it, but man, I'm working on it, you know, I'm working on paying the credit cards off, you know, I'm not going to drink as much this week, or hey, you know, I'm really trying to find a better, better, you know, soulmate for me kind of thing. And you kind of think that it's pretty easy, right? 
Now, the problem is that there's a bunch of little cravings inside of us that actually do more damage sometimes if we're not paying attention. Uh, if you look at your life, think about the times you've been most discouraged, the times you've been most angry, the times you've been most petrified with fear, the times you felt the deepest level of despair. And what you often find sometimes under the surface is that the reason you feel that is because you have an unfulfilled craving, right? There's something that if only God was to just fix my marriage, if only he would just do that, everything would be okay. You crave that so bad and then you get so angry. If only God was to give me the job that I've been trying so hard to get, if only he did that, everything would be perfect. Or maybe it's like, hey, if only God would just fix my kids, man. Like, I just don't get it. Like, I don't understand it. You get this deep level of anxiety. And underneath the surface is an actual craving that's driving and destroying your sense of emotional peace and your sense of joy and happiness in the world. Now, I want to take a quick side note real quick just to say this, is that if you are dealing with a clinical level of, like, despair or a clinical level of depression, it's a totally different story for you. The chemicals inside of our bodies can really shape our worlds, and so this is not for you, okay? Grace and peace be upon you. God is with you, my friend. That said, for the rest of us, we want to be proactive about the cravings of our lives, and try to figure out what it is under the surface. So take a moment here, and let's reflect. What is it for you? Is it, are you one of the people that like crave certainty? And you crave it so badly that you're not gonna make a decision unless you have all the pieces in place first, unless you have all your ducks in a row, and you are just not moving. And everybody else around you knows you are not moving forward in life. You're not making a decision, but you are sitting there going, well, I don't, I'm not certain on which direction I'm supposed to go yet. Or maybe you're one of the kind of people that craves comfort. Do you push anything that would hurt or that would make you uncomfortable or anything that might destroy your comfort? You push it to the edges, and in so doing, you make your world smaller and smaller and smaller in order to stay comfortable. Maybe for you, it's actually independence. You want to be self-determining. You want to be the person who creates and has freedom to do what you want to do. But the problem is, is that you don't commit to anything. You're, you're the person who holds off to the last possible second to say if you're coming to the party. Right? You're the person who doesn't want to actually have to volunteer and serve because if I did that, man, I would be locked in for like a couple weeks a month and that would determine what I have to do on that day. And do I really want to be locked down? But everybody else around you knows you're unreliable and everybody else around you doesn't trust you in the same way and you've created death in that way for yourself. Maybe for you it's achievement. Maybe you're one of those people that's sitting there saying, hey, I just need just one more degree. Like, hey, I know I've got two masters, but maybe the doctorate would make me feel better. Or maybe it's, I just need one more promotion at work. If I just worked my, my, my butt off really, really hard this next year, maybe I would get to that next level. I just need one more promotion. I need one more raise. I just need one more of this. And all of you achievers are, would be pretty honest, I'm sure, to say, you know what? The more achievements you get, the less meaningful those achievements become. And that hole inside of you never gets filled, right? Maybe for you, it's actually the feeling of being right. You've studied well, you've learned really hard, and you know you are absolutely right on this political issue or on this theological issue, and you just have this level of outrage that other people would not do it the way you think you do it. And the problem is that you know inside you're feeling righteous about this thing, but every other person around you knows that you're being hard and rigid, and you're not somebody that they want to be around because you don't project grace on others. For me, it's knowledge. I crave knowledge. I crave knowing things. And the hard part is you can't swallow the world, right? The deeper you go into the rabbit hole of knowing things, the more stuff you find out there is to know. And so then I feel this deep lack of, of understanding and I feel like I'm not smart enough or not knowing things well enough. Maybe if we were deeply honest, your disordered craving is actually around spirituality. You ever known somebody or you ever been that person who you feel really strongly connected to God when you're here on a Sunday morning in this room? And so you try to recreate it throughout the week, right? You take all the worship songs and you make like a Spotify playlist and you listen to them to every single day. You study the passages. You do your own Bible study. You try to like do these things and the harder and harder and harder you grip onto spiritual life and the harder you try to conjure God, it feels like the further away he gets from you. And so you study harder, you listen to more worship music, you always talk about how God is blessing you, and yet inside, you don't feel any sense of that. Sometimes craving for spiritual life can actually be the thing that destroys us. And what's fascinating is that our cravings, we always think that they're just kind of how we're made, right? And we always just think that it's kind of like just the, the thing about us that's just personal, right? And the reality is that God takes 
that a lot more seriously than we do. God takes our sin, takes our brokenness, takes our trouble a lot more seriously because he realizes how deeply intertwined we are with one another. Remember, when Achan sins, the people get killed in Ai. When we have brokenness and when we think we can cheat around the edges of our lives, it actually affects the people sitting next to you inside of this room. You just never know it. Uh, any fans of the NFL in here? Anybody else follow, like, you guys Colts fans at all? I'm, I'm a Niners fan, but uh, I've got no animosity. We're good, right? There's, there's no jealousy between us. We're different conferences, you know, no big deal. We're, we could be friends, right? But if you follow the NFL, you know it's one of the ultimate team sports, right? It's one of those things where every play, every player needs to be 100% locked in mentally and physically to what is happening in this moment. And we all know as football fans what happens if, a, if it doesn't happen, right? A play breaks down. You got a lineman who all of a sudden just like gets tired for one split second and lets up. And when he lets up, what happens? You get a guy bursting through and your quarterback has an ACL tear and is out for the rest of the season, right? What happens when all of a sudden the quarterback decides to think about like what he's having for dinner later that night? Have you ever had one of those plays where you look at your quarterback and you're like, what were you thinking? You're just like chucking the ball downfield, right? You ever had the moment where you know the play is perfect, you see it shaping up, you're watching it on TV and you know that the wide receiver is going to cut right now and then he just keeps running and the ball shows up where he was supposed to cut and you're like, dude, know what your assignment was. And the problem is, is that sin functions a lot like that. See, here's the deal, is that we, as the people of God, are responsible to one another. We're responsible to, to, to constantly chase God harder and to allow Jesus to affect our lives even deeper because we need one another. We need one another to be able to, to expand and to grow, to be able to project blessing into the world. But when one of us, even one of us, has sin issues inside of our hearts, when we have cravings that are disordered, when we have things that are broken, in those moments it begins to pour out onto every person around you, and you just don't realize it. So here's the thing, is if we're all addicts in one way or another, if we're always pouring out onto everybody else and we're all intertwined, what do we do about it, right? What then? Is, is there any hope? Now, remember how I told you the Valley of Accor ends up showing up again in the Bible? It actually becomes a metaphor inside of the Bible for the place of brokenness in the world. And here's what happens. In Hosea 2... There's an interesting verse in verse 13 where the author ends up bringing back the Valley of Accor again into the spotlight and saying some pretty unique things about it. Now, this passage has a couple like kind of little interesting bits and pieces to it. So as we read it, I'm going to help you walk through those parts so it begins to be a little bit easier to understand. So Hosea chapter 2, verse 13 says this, I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the Baals. Now pause. This is where, like, all of a sudden, when you're reading kind of minor prophets and kind of that section of the Bible you never go to, where you start kind of going off the rails and you're like, dude, I have no idea what the heck this passage is talking about, right? Here's the thing. The I in the passage is God. He's saying, I will punish her. The her is the people of God. So it's just kind of a stand-in for the people of God. Now, the Baals, this is a really weird word, right? The Baals were little household idols that they had that they thought brought them, like, fertility and blessing, right? And so they would think, hey, if we keep this in the house, we might have more kids, right? And, you know, if we put it out by the cows, maybe the, the cows will have more cows, and then we get richer because we got more cows, or maybe it'll bring rain upon the crops. And so it was kind of this thing where it's like they kept sacrificing to them because like, well, what if we don't? You know, you don't want to experience what happens if you don't sacrifice to your Baal, right, kind of thing. And what God is saying is, hey, you've sacrificed to the things you shouldn't be sacrificing to. And all of us can look and be like, ah, silly Israelites and their little Baals. But here's the reality. How often do we sacrifice to something that we think is going to keep us safe and sound, right? Sacrificing to keep money going, sacrificing to keep peace and happiness in our hearts and our lives. We have our own version of this, okay? So keep going in the verse here. It says, I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales. The bale. She decked herself out with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but, she, uh, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly to her. There I will give back to her vineyards, and I will make the valley of a core a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day that she came out of Egypt. Now, a couple quick things to note here. There's a big bad word in there that we hate, and that is punishment, especially when it comes from God. We're like, hey, God is love. God does not punish. Well, notice the thing that gets tied together with punishment in this, in this verse. It's tenderness, right? Tenderness. Is God tender toward us? Does he like to take care of us in a way that we don't think maybe we need to be taken care of. See, here's the thing. 
yesterday, I was, uh, I was out at the lake, out at our, our, my in-law's lake house, and my family was out there because we were going to go swimming, right? And so my oldest daughter, she loves to go on the boats. She loves to go swimming. It's like her favorite thing in the world to do. Well, yesterday was just one of those days. It was one of those days where all of a sudden she starts throwing a fit. She's like, it's too cold out. And we're like, it's like 98 degrees outside. What are you talking about, right? And she's like, I don't want to go in the water. I don't want to put on my swimsuit. I don't want to get on the boat. I don't want to do all this stuff. And we're like, we came here to swim. It's going to bring you joy and happiness to be on the boat, right? And instead, she's like fighting tooth and nail. And it's like, you, know, you parents in the room all know this, right? It's like one of those things where like one moment it's kind of just like, yeah, I don't want to do that. And the next moment it's like on the ground, like pounding the fists, wailing, right? Kicking, screaming, rolling at the top of her lungs. And I felt like I should hand her like an Oscar for like best acting in a drama or something because it was, it was in, to be fair, it was really impressive meltdown, right? And as she's doing this, I'm looking at her saying, hey, the rest of us, we can't go on the boat until you're ready to go. We can't just leave you here by yourself. So, sweetheart, I'm going to have to give you a consequence if you do not start settling down. And sure enough, what happens? Oh, my, my daughter, she does not settle down. Like, she just keeps going and going and going and going, right? And so she's crying. I'm all of a sudden trying to pick her up, and she's, like, wriggling in my arms. And I take her over to the couch, and I just I, I tell her, I'm like, sweetheart, I have to take away the toy that you want to play with right now. It's not the thing that's going to bring you the most joy. And as she's doing that, as I take that away from her, and as I tell her, I'm sorry, I can't give this back to you right now, my heart begins to break as a father, right? You see your little girl, and you see her losing it, and you see her impulses going out of control. You see her controlled by something that she doesn't even herself know how to control. And my heart just aches, and tears were welling in my eyes as I'm trying to take care of her. And I sat there, and I told her, I was like, sweetheart, I love you more than anything. And there's a sense of tenderness for her. Even though she was kicking and screaming, I just kept telling her over and over again, I love you, sweetheart. I love you. I love you. It's okay to settle down now. And I wonder sometimes if God taking us into the desert is a little bit like that. I wonder sometimes if, if it's a little bit like we worry that punishment is just going to destroy our lives and rip everything away from us. And God is saying, no, that is not what punishment looks like. It looks like taking away the things that are broken from you. It looks like taking away the things that were actually hurting you and you didn't realize it. And instead, I'm going to replace it with blessing and hope. Did you see that in the passage? Isn't that crazy? God sits there and says, hey, the place where you are most craving, the place where your trouble was strongest, it's not like you have to get past that valley before I start blessing you. I'm going to open up that door of hope in the valley itself. And so for you this morning, where are you at? Is it one of those days where you feel like you're in the valley and that you've, you're the one that who's been stoned? They're probably going to name the valley after you because things are so wrong in your life. Know this. God can take that valley and transform it. If a valley named after a guy named Achan can be transformed into a door of hope, your life can be transformed as well. Maybe you don't feel like you're in the valley yet, but maybe you're in the grips of things. If you're in the grips of consumerism, know this, that God provides for you. You have no need to continually accumulating. If you are gripped by the need for certainty, know this, the only certainty that will never fail you in life is Jesus himself. If you're somebody who's craving comfort this morning and that's driving your decision-making, know this, that Jesus is the surest and most compassionate, safe place that you could ever be. Maybe if you're the person who's in craving independence, maybe you should know that the only way you will ever be free is when you let go and lose yourself. If you're craving achievement, know that your worth was determined a long time ago and that you have no need to prove yourself anymore. If you are the person who needs to be right and feel that deep sense of outrage, know this, you are already right because of Jesus and he loves you and he loves those people next to you. If you're worried that your spiritual life isn't deep enough and that it can only happen inside the church, know this, that God is alive and active outside of those doors as well. That the Holy Spirit is near you every second, every moment of the day. You have no need to conjure his presence in your car or your home. Just open your eyes. The poet John Donne said this. He said, enthrall me. Take me to you. Imprison me. Because if you don't imprison me, I'm going to be imprisoned by something else. And if you don't ravish me, I will be ravished by something else. See, what he knew about human desire and human craving was this. The only way to break craving down is to put something more beautiful in front of you in its place. 
So this morning, regardless of what craving that you are holding on to, whatever has you in its grips, know this. Turn your eyes toward the ultimate beauty of Jesus. He's the only one that talks about life in a different way. The only one that says you do not have to be the person that you are today, tomorrow. That he can change you and shape you. That he can take the valley of a core in your life and turn it into something beautiful, a place of hope. Turn your eyes and be ravished by Jesus himself. And if you feel like that's impossible, God turns to you and says, no, no, no. If even ache and sin can be redeemed to the point that his name ends up being synonymous with a place of hope, then your life could become a place of hope and blessing for everybody around you because we are intertwined like that. May you be ravished by Jesus. Will you pray? Father, we want you more than anything. God, our hearts and our minds, all of us, we are people who are addicts, Lord, that are chasing after things that are not healthy for us. God, some of us know that. Some of us hide it. Some of us don't know it yet. Lord, will you be our provision? God, will you change and shape us from the inside out, Lord? Will you capture our eyes, capture our sensibilities, capture our hearts with your beauty, with your hope, with your sense of joy that surpasses anything we could have known otherwise, God, that we might become different people for the world around us, that we might be able to serve better and love better and create better and hope better. Father, thank you for opening that door of hope for us in Jesus. We love you. Amen.